our modern day-to-day -day lives are made of countless interactions with the objects we encounter. From the tiniest particles to the biggest structures. Join us as we explore the inside workings of the world around us. This is Inside Things. Virtual Reality Virtual reality means experiencing things that don't exist in real life via believable, interactive, 3D computer-generated worlds. What makes a virtual reality? First, it must be believable. Like feeling you're really in Mars or in a jungle during the Jurassic period. And throughout the entire time, you should remain convinced that you're really in that different world. Second, it should be interactive. So as you move, the virtual reality world moves with you. In 3D films, you can be transported down underwater, but it's not interactive. Next, it must be computer generated. This is because only 3D computer graphics have the power to quickly generate believable, interactive, and alternate worlds that change real time as we move within it. A virtual reality should also be explorable. It should be big and detailed enough for you to explore it yourself. Not like in a book, where a place or character can only be explored as the author describes it. And finally, it should be immersive. A virtual reality should engage both your body and mind. It conveys the world's sight, sound, smell, taste, and the feel of being in it or part of it. These are important elements of a virtual reality. From this, we've understood why reading a book, looking at a painting, watching a film, or listening to a song isn't an experience of virtual reality. All of these art forms only give us partial glimpses of another reality. What's common among them is that they aren't interactive. You can't explore them fully yourself, and they are not fully believable. Another example would be watching in the cinemas. Sure, it can take you to a different world, but the moment you take your eyes off the screen, you're reminded that you're just inside the theater. You also can't reach out and touch the realities in the screen or go inside it. In other words, such art forms are essentially passive. That's the main difference of a virtual reality. It makes you think that you're actually living inside this completely believable virtual world. It's two-way interactive because you respond according to what you experience and the world responds to you. Eyeballs Why are our eyes like cameras? It's because they function similarly. Cameras Taking a photo the camera's shutter opens to take in light from the subject it is capturing. The light rays pass through the lenses and get recorded in the film or a digital chip. The recorded picture will appear upside down. Now how do our eyes work similarly? Light also passes through the lens of your eyes and is recorded on the back of your eye or the retina. The retina also records the images you see upside down, but you don't see it that way. This is because the recorded images are processed by your brain, which turns it the right way up. Now, let's take a look into the parts of your eye that make these functions possible. The cornea is the see-through skin that covers the front of your eyes. It is like clear glass as it has no blood vessels in it. 
The sclera is the tough skin that covers the outside of the eyeball. It's the white part of the eyes. The iris modulates the amount of light that enters the eye. It's the colored part of the eyes. The pupil is the colored part of the iris. It allows the light in. In very bright light, the pupil contracts, then gets bigger in dim light. The lens focuses light onto the retina. It changes shape to ensure that the images in the retina is as clear as possible. The retina functions like a movie screen that projects the images you're seeing. It has rods, which can see black and white, and cones, which can see colors. The retina converts the images into messages for the brain to translate. The optical nerves are like the wires that carry the messages, the images from the retina to the brain. Then of course, we have the outer parts that protect the eyeballs. The eyelids to shut out light, and the eyelashes and eyebrows that filter out dust and other external dirt. The tear glands, which protects the eyes from damage by keeping the eyeballs clean and moist. And finally, the conjunctiva, where you'll see the tiny blood vessels on your eyes. When your eyes are sore, these blood vessels get bigger and make your eyes look red. Thermometer How does the thermometer work? A thermometer is a device used to measure the temperature of things. Its name comes from the words thermo, which means heat, and meter, which means to measure. Galileo Galilei, who discovered the solar system, is also one of the first inventors of the thermometer. He used a device called the thermoscope back in 1600, about 400 years ago. But the thermometers we use today are nothing like the ones Galileo used. Today's thermometers usually look like this. A bulb at the base and a long glass tube that stretches to the top. Early thermometers used water, but because water freezes, it was impossible to measure temperatures at less than water's freezing point. So alcohol became the substitute. Alcohol freezes at temperatures below the water's freezing point. Another alternative used could be mercury, which is a metallic liquid. Now, the red-colored substance, or the silver line that you see in the middle of the thermometer, moves up and down, depending on the temperature. The line gets longer in hot temperatures, while it goes down in cold temperatures. It works the same for both thermometers using alcohol or mercury. There are numbers placed at the side of the glass tubes to mark the temperatures to where the colored line reaches. Temperatures are measured in Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Fahrenheit is used mostly in the United States, while the rest use Celsius. Fahrenheit is named after the German physicist Gabriel Fahrenheit. According to his records, Water's freezing point is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, Celsius takes after Anders Celsius, whose scale was formerly known as the centigrade scale. Centigrade means divided into 100 degrees. According to his study, water's freezing point is at 0 degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. The Celsius measurement is said to be the more accurate one and is used in the metric system. Both scientists developed their scales back in 1724. Another unit to measure temperature is Kelvin. Kelvin is named after Lord Kelvin, who invented the Kelvin scale in 1848. It starts at 0 degrees Kelvin, called absolute temperature, or the point where molecules don't move. It measures the coldest temperature there can be. Because according to him, there's no limit as to how hot an object can get. But there's a limit to its coldness.
Guitar Strings Do you know how much new strings can change the performance of your guitar? Know more about the different types of guitar strings to improve your instrument's tonality and playability. Brown bound strings are the most common. It has a steel wire core and wrapped with a round wire alloy. This type can be squeaky and may hasten fret wear because of the uneven string surface that scrapes the frets. Meanwhile, flat bound strings, commonly used by jazz artists, use a flat wire wrap. This type is soft in the fingers, easy to slide, and don't wear the frets as fast. However, in terms of tone, they are not as loud or bright as round bound strings. Flat bound strings have a smoother, darker tone that works better for jazz music. Hex wound strings use a hex shaped wire core. String windings are wound around the core. And the corners of the hex wire grip allow better windings. Because of this, strings are easier to play and are richer in tone. Guitar strings are also made of different material. Strings make sound because they vibrate, and the pitch is modified by the thickness, tension, and the length of the string. Longer strings produce a lower tone than shorter ones. Tighter strings produce a higher sound than looser ones. Thicker strings produce a lower sound than thinner strings. That is why, even though all the strings on a guitar are the same length, they all sound a different note. Electric guitar strings are typically made of steel, nickel, and chromium alloys because of their magnetic properties. Stainless steel strings produce a bright sound and is more resistant to oxidation, which is the most often cause of the guitar string's deterioration. Nickel-plated steel has excellent magnetic properties, providing a bright sound, while chrome is commonly used in flat mount strings and is preferred by jazz musicians for its dark sound. Acoustic guitar strings use alloys that reverberate sound better, such as bronze and brass. Strings that use bronze alloy produce bright, crisp tones, while brass strings produce an exceptionally bright sound. Nylon strings are compatible only with guitars made specifically for them. Aside from the material, the string's diameter or gauge is also important. Strings with larger gauge have more vibrating mass, producing a louder, thicker tone. However, these strings need more tension to be brought up to pitch, thus making it more difficult to press down the fingerboard. Usually, strings used for acoustic guitars have thicker gauges than electric strings because they need to project more. Zipper did you know that zippers function by the use of the two oldest and simplest tools in history? That's right, a zipper works through a wedge and a hook. Going back to what we know about simple tools, let's discuss the wedge and the hook. A wedge is an object with an inclined or slanted surface. When you push a wedge forward against an object, the wedge pushes it to the right or left. Any force exerted by the wedge is always perpendicular to the direction where the wedge is moving. Meanwhile, a hook is a curved material that can get another piece of material. Simple yet sturdy, the hook is often used as a fastening device, which works together with a loop or an eye or a hollow area to attach the hook. Now to further understand how a zipper works, Let's take a closer look at its basic parts. So each zipper has two main parts. Slide is the part you pull, and teeth is what you call the parts on the two sides being zipped. Look closely at the teeth of the zipper. You'll see that they're shaped like little hooks. This is how they are able to close and unclose an object because the little hooks lock and unlock together every time the slide is pulled up or down. A zipper track is made of dozens of teeth, each having a hook and a hollow. The goal is for the two to meet. Each little hook from one side of the zipper track 
must attach to its corresponding hollow from the opposite zipper track. Now, the latching mechanism is called the slide. Likewise, the slide is a collection of wedges. As the slide moves up, the two opposite zipper tracks should be positioned at a specific angle. So, as the slide moves through it, its inclined edges push the two opposite zipper tracks, or the teeth, together. Of course, this simple mechanism would only work effectively if each tooth are identical, having exactly the same size and shape. Each part should also be positioned perfectly on the track. Well-made zippers, in fact, make an incredibly secure bond, making it extremely difficult to separate the teeth by pulling apart the two zipper tracks. But simply, pulling the slide can easily separate them. That's how the simple mechanism works. Nuclear power Nuclear power, put simply, is energy contained in atoms. But what is nuclear power and how is it used? First, let's discuss the principles behind generating nuclear power. Take a look at the atom structure. Atoms are like mini solar systems. You'll see at its center is its nucleus, like the sun in our solar system and around it are its orbiting electrons like the planets. Now, inside the nucleus are protons and neutrons, which are very densely packed together. Take note that the nucleus is held together with such a great force, and it is said to be the strongest force in nature. However, the nucleus can be split apart once it collides with a neutron. And when a neutron causes a nucleus to split, this reaction is called fission. So how is this concept related with nuclear power? Well, it follows the same process in generating nuclear power. The uranium element is used, primarily because its atom is very, very large. Therefore, because of its huge size, the atomic force that holds it together is relatively weak. And this is what makes the uranium more predisposed for the process of fission. And although uranium is rather rare, making up only two parts per million of the Earth's crust, the element contains a great supply of energy due to its radioactivity. You can actually say that a pound or 0.43 kilograms of uranium is equivalent to as much energy that three pounds or 1.36 kilograms of coal has. And how is this relevant in nuclear power? Well, nuclear power plants use uranium. It uses neutrons to collide with the uranium to split them. And this split also causes the uranium to release more neutrons, which in turn now collides with other atoms. This will then cause a chain reaction, which is controlled via control rods that absorb the neutrons. Now, how is electricity generated from nuclear power? In the middle of all the nuclear reactors, or right at its core, the fission of uranium atoms releases energy that can heat water up to 520 degrees Fahrenheit or 271.111 degrees Celsius. And this hot water is what will spin the turbines that are connected to the generators to produce what we call electricity. A flower. How do we understand the flower and the function of its parts? One way is to differentiate them into male and female parts. Let's start with the male part, which is the stamen. It has the filament and the anther, which produce pollen. The anther produces and contains pollen. It is found on top of a long stalk 
that is almost as fine as hair, which is the filament. Usually, the number of stamen present in a flower is equivalent to the number of petals it has. Then we have the pistil, which is the female part of the flower. It consists of the stigma, style, and ovary. Each pistil is made of one to many rolled leaf-like forms. Let's take a closer look. The stigma is the sticky bulb you see at the center of the flower. It's the part that receives the pollen grains where they germinate. The style is the long stalk where the stigma is connected. The ovary is found at the bottom of the flower. This is where the seeds are, which becomes the fruits we eat. The ovary contains ovules, which are what become seeds. Other parts of the flower include the petal, which are of course the colorful part of the flower. Petals should be bright and attractive to get pollinators, or the insects to approach the flower. There's also the sepal. You'll find it at the bottom of the flower bud that looks like little green leaves. It works as a protective covering for the flower bud before it blooms. So how do all the parts work together in pollination? Pollination is simply how insects help plants make seeds. So first, the insects are attracted to the flower because of its bright colors. The insects eat the nectar and pollen. In the process, the insect has transferred pollen from the previous flower it has visited to the current flower it is in. At the same time, the insect is also getting pollen from the current flower it is in, which will also be transferred to the next. When the flower receives pollen from another flower, through the insect, the pollen fertilizes the egg cells to make seeds, and therefore make more flowers of its same kind. There you have it, another episode down the drain. Still, there are countless more things to explore. Join us next time as we look and know more about the world around us. See you next time on Inside Things.